It's 10 o'clock, so I will call this meeting to order. And the first thing on the agenda is public comment. Do we have anybody here to make public comment? Okay. And I didn't see that we'd received anything. So we will go on then. And with approval of the minutes, do I hear a motion? So moved. And all in favor? There we go. We'll raise our hand. All right, minutes approved. Um, and any board member comments before we get started with presentations? All right, we'll dive right in. And we have a change to the agenda. We're going to hear first from, I think, um, Ms. Claybaugh, I thought was on here about the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund. Good morning. Um, I'm Heather Claybaugh, Budget Officer for Frederick County Public Schools. I'm also joined by Doreen Bass, um, our grants coordinator. And today we are here to present or look for approval or acceptance rather of the commonly referred to ESSER grant, which is part of the CARES Act. This is the first of four grants that are coming through the CARES Act to FCPS. Um, this grant covers a number of activities, including our um, some activities for our operations department, food and nutrition, summer activities for general ed students, summer activities and then recovery services through the year for our students with disabilities, as well as some additional um, professional learning for new teachers, as well as some distance professional learning. As part of this act, we, because this funding comes through our, excuse me, the U.S. Department of Education, we are required to set aside a portion of the funds to our non-public schools in Frederick County. As, and we have also decided in order to provide services for our charter schools, we are also providing them with a PPA um, for the funds to use as well. Um, and they are completing applications and are under the same sort of um, guidelines that FCPS had to follow to receive the funds, those schools will be receiving the funds as well. Um, the amount of this is just a bit over $4 million. The funds start on 7-1-2020 and run through 9-30-2022. So it's quite an, uh, um, a long grant period. Are there any questions regarding the grant? Sorry, any questions? Um, I guess I would just ask Heather, what was the process for deciding um, our priorities? So we started with a cabinet level discussion as, and then the ACTS team met regarding the um, academic portions and the majority of the grant are school-based academic. We spoke to our operations department because fortunately there were some items that we could cover through operations. We're using it for um, masks that are washable. It's a service that we'll have throughout the year and that will be for staff. We also are using it um, for our lunch monitors for our elementary age students as well as some additional items that our food serve, food and nutrition service folks need to prepare items for the classroom. So what we tried to do is strategically determine what things were that we at this time um, felt were the most important. Frankly, the majority of the funds for the elementary, or excuse me, for the, on the educational side of the house will be for summer um, items this summer, virtual and then in person for our youngest learners, as well as then some supports throughout the school year as well. So it was a very collaborative effort. We, we looked throughout the entire system to try to meet what we thought at this very moment were our needs, but we know that those needs may change. The fortunate thing about the grant is like all grants, there is an amendment opportunity. So if we don't spend all the funds immediately and we realize that there is an additional need or something else happens, um, we have the opportunity to amend it. And I say this um, knowing that $4 million is a lot of money, 
but in this situation, it is not a lot of money because it gets spent very quickly. So we certainly could have spent this $4 million five times over and just to meet the needs of our, of, that we've found through, our, through the COVID pandemic. Absolutely. Um, we've had a few new people join from the county side, and um, I didn't know if anybody, we're talking about the ESSER, um, the, the grant, and if um, anybody has any thoughts or questions that just joined us, um, feel free to chime in. Um, I'm looking at page 18 of your uh, of the report, attached report, where mm -hmm. the non-public -pub transfers, and there is a list of six schools um, with the number of students. So are those students special needs students? So unfortunately, this is one of the things that we will be amending. <laughs> when we started the process, it was the, there's been some back and forth between the U.S. Department of Ed and our and our counterparts at MSDE regarding what the non-public funding requirements were. This was based upon the number of Title I eligible, or excuse me, the number of farm eligible students in a Title I. Um, area at, that attended those schools. The U.S. Department of Education has issued guidance that we are now being asked to follow that is simply based upon the number of students. So this will be changed. It will actually increase um, if, if participation happens as we, as Doreen originally calculated, we'll probably see this increase by about $100,000 to cover the students. So there's just been some back and forth, and, and as I understand from an article Doreen sent yesterday, that there may continue to be some back and forth because some school boards, some states have decided to um, enter litigation against the Department of Education. So we are going with the new guidance, so we will be amending this, so there will be some additional students. So originally it was, ba as I said, it was based upon the neediest students, students farm eligible, but we're now moving back to a simple PPA based upon the number of students enrolled K through 12. Thank you, Heather. Anything else, Ray or Jay? I just want to say that it seems like it, a long process that was done very quickly and um, putting all of this together, um, you guys do some, you, you ladies do some great work and it's very appreciative that this was dumped on you and you have put it together in such a nice form that it's very easy to understand. So thank you very much for, for being put under this stressful um, procedure. You're quite welcome. And we'll be back with some more grants later in the summer. <laughs> the process is just beginning. <laughs> oh, so you're not We're done. Gonna, you know, <laughs> it, it's money that we definitely need. And, you know, that. so we don't want to wiggle would tease about it. But, it, you know, it all happens in, a, you know, two weeks. Tell us your plan for $4 million. Okay. So... <laughs> I didn't realize it was that quick. <laughs> um, this one gave us, I think, almost a month, but we're in the process right now of a two-week tell us your plan for $4 million for wow. some additional federal money, So, which is wonderful. Um, so we definitely don't want to turn any money down, absolutely, um, and mm -hmm. it will fill a need, but it's right now we're in a crazy crunch time. So, Mr. Mason, I'll, I'll add to your sentiment there. The... Uh, the entire fiscal services group has been absolutely awesome since we moved into the pandemic, not only with these grants, but just assisting us with our operating budgets and the changes and in, in, in that we needed for that. They've been um, very active and responsive problem solvers. So um, from Leslie all the way down, we've appreciated that in the other departments. So. Thank you. I will pass that along to, the, to my colleagues in fiscal services. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mason and Dr. Cuppet for pointing that out because uh, we really do appreciate everything you all do. And and I think the public trusts you as well. I think it's very, um, the books are open, the public can see. And um, I think that goes a long way to the trust that people hopefully have. I, I trust you all, but I think the public does as well. So thank you. Thank you. 
And with that, we're going to let you go get back to spending that other $4 million. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Okay. Uh, next up, we have equity in social studies education. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kevin Cuppet. I'm the executive director for curriculum instruction and innovation here in Frederick County Public Schools. And we're very excited to bring this presentation to you today. We do appreciate the committee's interest in this topic. Uh, it's certainly timely, but I, I did want to present a little context that this kind of work around equity we have been doing for quite a while in the school district now. Um, several years ago, I don't even know how many it is, uh, we began um, with the support of the board and their equity policy, which was great leadership, I feel, uh, for Frederick County Public Schools, um, launched all kinds of additional work in the district, specifically in the curriculum department. I want the board members and the public to know that we began developing our content-specific equity plans uh, at the very beginning of this year. Um, we had been we had engaged in several department equity activities prior to this, but we asked each of the content areas to go through a process with us where we would identify areas of impact that we could make from the curriculum department, um, whether it's in professional learning or selection of resources and materials or interpretation of standards, uh, hiring practices for teachers, retention practices for teachers, et cetera. So we took a, a wide look and had a lot of great conversation uh, in the first semester around this and then sent departments, uh, individual content departments out to begin developing their um, equity plans. And um, they were due back, I believe, uh, the very beginning of April. And we all remember what happened in March. So at the beginning of March, uh, might have been even the last week of February, I redirected the efforts of our team to be able to support what we expected would be a period of distance learning. Uh, now that we've returned back to our curriculum workshops, teams are now starting to refocus back on those equity components now that the distance learning emergency is, is over. So um, we are looking broadly across the entire department at, the, at our practices. And uh, I'm hoping that maybe at some point in the future, that might be a good presentation uh, to bring back to the CNI committee, because we really believe that this idea of equity is not only rooted in history, it certainly is in our history education. I'm glad we're covering that topic, uh, but equity is also something we need to attend to in our library and media services area, in our literacy areas, in our selection of books for English courses and so on and so forth, all the way into our sciences and mathematics. Uh, um, we're even, uh, even continuing the work of equity around dual enrollment, which is now in our department as well. So that, this has been a big conversation. And so um, I wanted the board to have, uh, board members to have that perspective about the work we've been doing in CII. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Colleen Bernard and her team. And if anybody who's contributing to this uh, presentation, if you can ad identify yourself and your title for the public, that would be great. All right, Colleen, it's all yours. Good morning. I'm Colleen Bernard, and I'm the Curriculum Specialist for Secondary Social Studies. You're on mute, Karen. Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Kim Day, the Elementary Curriculum Specialist for Social Studies. Good morning, everyone, and my name is James Hines. I am the Teacher Specialist for Social Studies for Frederick County Public Schools. Good morning, I'm Boris Fultz. I serve as the Supervisor of Accelerating Achievement and Equity. I think we might have just lost Colleen Bernard. Yes, I think so. Okay, yeah. Um, let's give her a second to reconnect because I think she probably has the first slide. <laughs> um, and James, will you be presenting? Here she comes. Yes, I'll start now. Okay. Thank you, James, for handling the technical side of this. Appreciate it. Sorry, for some reason it dropped me out. We're here today to address the board. You're on mute, Colleen. Somehow you got switched to mute. Okay, am I good now? <laughs> yeah, we'll see, go with it. <laughs> All right, we'll see. Um, we're here today to address the board's information request regarding where in the social studies curriculum we teach black African-American history. 
Per your request, we've prepared a pre-K to 12 social studies standards document mapping standards that address historically marginalized groups, of which black African-American history standards are included. Prior to addressing the standards document, we'd like to, to provide some definitions that will help inform today's discussion and an overview of the curriculum design and implementation process used in the deployment of standards. And unfortunately, I can't see the presentation. Yeah, James, you want to share by a single tab rather than your whole um, screen. Try to un unpresent and present by just showing a single tab. Yeah, so we uh, we definitely practiced this previously, and of course, <laughs> the tab it is uh, not coming up. Of course, let me give it a shot from here, James. Sure. And it'll be the PDF version that I'll share. Got it. Perfect. And you can go ahead and go to that second slide if you would, please. All right. Thank you. Standards are but one component of a robust curriculum. The totality of curriculum includes standards, as well as instructional resources, professional learning, and ultimately deliver, delivery through instructional practices. Next, we'll speak of each of these curricular components within the context of the board's request. First, let us turn our attention to standards. In the past four years, the Maryland State Department of Education has <laughs> new standards in both the elementary and secondary social studies programs. A new framework for elementary social studies was released to LEAs in June of 2020. It was released to LEAs so we can begin the process of building up curriculum, which includes crosswalking our current standards with the new ones, identifying and securing instructional resources, identifying professional learning needs, developing appropriate professional learning for teachers, and aligning instructional practice to the new framework. To do this, we will need human resources to help with the curriculum development and new instructional resources for implementation of the new standards. It is my intention to bring the new elementary standards to our board for approval in the spring of 2021 and begin implementation of the standards in the fall of 2021. In the secondary program, MSD first implemented new standards in American Studies 1 ahead of the new eighth grade assessment that was slated to be field tested May of 2020. That field test has been postponed until next May. The state also revamped the American government standards and assessment to address new standards and implementation, as well as the implementation of the Maryland 6.0 skills and processes disciplinary literacy standards in social studies. Next, the state revised the modern world history framework, and most recently, the American Studies II framework. Per our previous CNI committee meetings, we expected the AS2 standards earlier in the year. They were received in May, and we are asking the board to move forward with their implementation for this fall. You should have received a copy of these standards in support of this presentation. The framework documents from MSDE provide consistency in K-12 social studies education. The frameworks do more than just tell a teacher what to teach. They were developed to provide guidance in how to teach the standards as well. They use an inquiry approach called the inquiry arc. The inquiry approach is not new and it is actually best known in STEM teaching, but can be used and is used across content areas. At its core, Inquiry is about asking and answering questions. That happens to be the foundation of historical thinking. Instruction is framed around open-ended, thought-provoking questions that students then use their disciplinary literacy skills to examine primary and secondary sources, evaluate those sources, and ultimately make claims, construct arguments, and share conclusions using evidence. The inquiry approach teaches students to be critical consumers of information, a requisite life skill for all members of a democratic society. 
In addition to reframing the standards using an inquiry approach, the state has also used an equity lens for the development of their standards. This standard approach aligns with our culturally responsive teaching philosophy that provides a broader and more inclusive analysis of the historical record. When developing standards for our local essential curriculum, we incorporate the state standards language, as well as develop learning targets for teaching the standards and curating resource materials for support of the implementation of the standards. Instructional resources as part of the curriculum include approved basal and supplementary texts, content from subscription databases such as Gale and ABC Clio, and open educational resources or OERs. For each of our six core secondary social studies courses, we have approved basal and supplementary textbooks. These textbooks provide foundational information for instruction. However, textbooks have many limitations, including the focus on a single narrative. By leveraging technology, we have been able to untether ourselves from the single narrative in most textbooks and broaden the instructional resources we use to implement our standards. Additionally, using OER affords us the resiliency to use resources that are updated and help our students not only see themselves in what we teach, but to connect their learning to the world in which they live. In secondary social studies, we've also worked with the African American Resources Cultural Heritage Society of Frederick County to identify local artifacts, local history artifacts of the group that can be used in the support of the teaching of our standards. This work began in October of 2018 and continues today. We've partnered with the National Civil War Medical Museum to develop instructional materials that address medical history, its connection to today, and the legacy of women and black African Americans in Civil War medicine. We've worked closely with the Walters Gallery to provide interactive trunks. You're, Sorry. Yeah. You left off at, you're, you're on mute again, Colleen. You left off at interactive trunks. Thank you. Um, to, pro to provide interactive trunks to bring history alive in our classrooms, as well as mapping our curricular standards to resources available in the museum. We look forward to continuing and expanding all of these partnerships. Both the elementary and secondary social studies programs support multiculturalism through the provision of resources to all of our teachers for teaching about holidays and special observances. It is equally important to build our teacher's capacity to implement curriculum. To implement curriculum with fidelity, teachers must have efficacy, the belief that they have the skills necessary to do the work. When standards change, we have to ensure that our teachers have the requisite tools regarding content knowledge, instructional pedagogy, discipline-specific pedagogy, and the application of an equity lens that supports culturally responsive teaching. The Secondary Social Studies program has worked closely with the Equity Office to develop a variety of professional learning opportunities to build our teachers' capacity to address the teaching of the totality of our history. From self-selected se sessions on teaching about it in individuals enslaved in America during our August Curriculum Day to a day-long intensive program for American Studies One teachers addressing best practices for teaching Black African American history as American history. We've worked to increase our teachers' capacity to deliver the curriculum for all of our students. As part of the end of school PL this year, professional learning, I'm sorry, uh, this year, we provided a menu of content and instructional pedagogy sessions available online through institutions of higher learning, such as Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. We were fortunate to have Mr. Mason be a part of our professional learning we provided last fall and are planning to provide more of these opportunities moving forward. Additionally, during this spring's continuity of learning, Dr. Eric Lawrence Phillips from our equity office and our secondary social studies team provided direct virtual support to teachers as they grappled with how to address teaching history with fidelity about people who were enslaved, civil rights, the Holocaust, and many other topics within the limits of an asynchronous virtual environment that provided no opportunity for our teachers to interact in, in real time with students. 
while delivering content. After the killing of Mr. Floyd, the team again partnered with Dr. Lars Phillips and provided space for our teachers to touch base and process the events together virtually, as well as navigate the teaching of these current events with our students in a distance learning format. The strength of our curricular design is ultimately experienced through instructional practice. By leveraging technology, we broaden the historical narrative and provide avenues for meeting the individual needs of students and personalizing the learning process. Centrally, we have developed model units and lessons within the inquiry framework using a blended structure and an equity lens. Our investment in professional learning specifically related to verbal discourse in the social studies is evidenced by our teachers who regularly engage our students in the skills of discourse to communicate and critique conclusions by analyzing the credibility and corroborative value of sources, construct arguments based on reasoned judgment and evidence, and take informed action. This inquiry approach to instruction is complex and fosters deep learning for our students. Building the capacity of teachers to engage our students in this manner is an ongoing process. Overall, social studies is implementing new standards with an equity lens, curating and deploying a broad spectrum of resources, building capacity of teachers through professional learning, partnering with our equity, department to develop and implement multi-year integrated equity plans and with local organizations to support our curriculum implementation so that we can effectively address the totality of our history that weaves together an historical narrative inclusive of all of the peoples who have been a part of it. The success of any democracy is predicated on the education of its people. As social studies educators, we're on a mission to develop informed and engaged citizens for our democracy. Our work is a work in progress as we continue to evolve our professional practices to meet the needs of every student in FCPS. Do you have any questions? Any questions? I have some, uh, as I usually do. Um, so I'm looking at the um, curriculum standards uh, with historically marginalized groups and um, sort of more a general comment, but maybe you could put in context. Um, I think this would go to Kim. Um, history in elementary is really, would you say, a small part of the social studies curriculum? I would agree with that. So what we're seeing here is the totality of the history, but in in the context of the whole elementary social studies curriculum, it's a very small part. Yes, that I would I would agree with that. Um, and you know, there's nothing at this point that you can necessarily do about that. I myself, of course, I love teaching social studies, and history was one of my favorite parts to teach. So, but I think uh, this is where what you all are talking about with the professional learning and the resources. Um, you all know teachers find things they like to use that they feel work well with students and, and can get in a little bit of, a, I don't want to say a rut, but in, in a practice that then doesn't expand. So, um, but once shown new resources, a lot of times, you know, I'm speaking personally, you're, you're ready to grab onto them. So I, I love that work that you're doing of, of pulling people together, making them aware, and then providing resources. I think that is crucial. Um, to the whole thing and then finding ways to expand this because I did mostly teach language arts so that's where I could definitely pull in literature and um, and you know factual information that would support what they were doing in social studies or science any other comments yeah. or questions I would. Um, so locally, there's been some engagement about uh, anti-racist education. And do you feel that the standards and our practices are going to address that 
and continue to address that and keep moving forward um, as we go on. So, so Mr. Mason, I think that's a great question. It's certainly very timely. Um, one of one of the key things that we'll have to grapple with as a district is what exactly um, individuals mean by anti-racist. And so there are quite a few scholars out there that um, share that information. Um, I do, J Colleen, if you have a minute, I would love for you to talk about the audit that you did with banks, because I think that heads in the direction of really, Mr. Mason, lensing our work in a, in a, in a way that um, lifts up the importance of seeing things in our history that were racist practices and bringing those to the forefront, right? So everybody can point back and say, yes, slavery was a racist practice, but so much more um, has been um, predicated on race and has been challenging for our, our society. And, and what, what voice is given to those and where, where is that represented? So um, um, Colleen Bernard and a team of excellent teachers have just gone through a process I, I would like for you, for her to talk about, because I think this is getting a little bit to what I think you're looking for. So Colleen, do you want to talk about that briefly? Sure. So uh, as Dr. Cuppett said, we pulled together, uh, PL, we pulled together our equity plans uh, throughout the fall. And part of that equity plan was to conduct an equity audit of our curriculum. Really, where are our standards? Um, where do we need to bolster our standards with um, additional learning targets and resources and bring those to bear in our classrooms? So as part of the, the, the plan that we put together last year, um, I put together a plan to do this audit and gave it to Dr. Puppet in January. Uh, then the pandemic happened mm -hmm. and it got way late, um, but we were fortunate to be able to have uh, the resources in June to be able to pull together an excellent group of small, but excellent group of educators to um, audit our curriculum sixth grade through 11th grade. We're using um, Banks's uh, research and um, his levels of multiculturalism um, as our framework for uh, lensing our work on our equity audit. This is a preliminary audit, just looking over um, where we are operating on that framework. And it's a little bit difficult for me um, to, to speak to the, the framework for you without being able to show it to you. Um, and if you'd like, I could just jump in a little bit for that. Um, that'd be great, Eric. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the levels of integration of multicultural content. I can just be really share with you with those things as well. Number one, really looking at the interrupt real quick. I hear a little feedback. Thanks, Colleen. Okay, just wanted to get her muted because I was hearing a little feedback. Go ahead, Eric. Is it is this better? Okay, apologies on that. Uh, so when looking at banks, there's four levels. The first level is looking at the contributions approach, and we see this a lot throughout our curricula, where we're we're highlighting heroes and holidays, and um, we're celebrating certain moments throughout history of black and brown individuals, and then the, or other individuals who are part of marginalized groups. Level two is looking at the uh, um, additive approach. And this is when we look at content and concepts and themes and perspectives, but we don't change the structure in which we teach those things. Um, so the structure of our instruction remains the same, um, where they're placed within the curricula remains the same. Level three and four is really what we're aiming for, especially level four. In level three, we're looking at the transformation approach, and this is when the structure of the curriculum is actually changing, so that you're not just teaching a moment in a, a marginalized, in the, marginalized group's history or a collective history, but that's interwoven throughout the curricula. It's interwoven throughout the totality of our history, specifically in social studies. And then the social action approach is where we're actually looking at help, helping students to make decisions on important social issues and how they can inform those social issues. But in, in order to inform those social issues, they have to know the collective history, the um, full depth and breadth of the history that we all share our collective history. And, and even though we're talking about this and looking at it through social studies content, these four levels apply to all content areas. It is not just the responsibility of social studies curriculum or content to make sure that we're, the students are able to see themselves um, our curricula, our, our, our um, education structures are very Eurocentric. Um, they are by white, they're dominated by white culture um, and European culture. Um, and, so, and I think we have to acknowledge that because what we have to begin to do is break down some of those structures. Um, and I can talk on and on about that, 
But in, in relation to that, uh, Mr. Mason, you asked about anti-racist curriculum. And I think it's important to note that um, when we're thinking about that, that's really identifying and eliminating racism in those structures that are inequitable, especially toward marginalized groups. And when, we're, when I mention marginalized groups, I am mentioning people of color, but we're also thinking about women. We're thinking about those who are part of the LGBTQI plus community, um, those who are in poverty, all of those marginalized groups throughout our history. And so really breaking down those structures. So a curriculum that's focused in specifically on um, racism and anti-racism and dismantling those structures that are in place requires a great deal of forethought as far as how do we prepare teachers to be able to teach that not just in social studies, but across the curriculum. And that's out of my purview to make that decision. But there's a lot involved in making those decisions when it comes to that type of curriculum. Um, so is the same framework, the same equity framework being used and applied outside of the social studies department? So Dr. Cuppet, you talked about the um, equity audit happening across mm -hmm. Um, content curriculum areas. Is that the same framework that is being applied in the other content areas? So I'm not sure all specialists have used it yet, but different specialists took on different components of what they were doing. So what were the, what were the uh, entry points for you to engage in equity? Um, uh, so for instance, Mary Jo Richmond um, has both a media curriculum and she has the collection itself. What books are available for kids to actually go in and check out? She initially wanted to deal with collection because it's tied to budget, it's tied to the timing of the allocations to media specialists. So she felt that was kind of the first bite of the apple. Um, Kim Day, because she was receiving new standards, wanted to wait until the actual new standards were there. She's going to engage in that process in the coming year as part of um, the standards deployment that she'll have. Um, where Areas where it becomes... Um, I don't want to call it problematic, but a little more challenging is moving into areas, um, for instance, in, in science and mathematics, because those are areas that have not traditionally spent a lot of time thinking about these things. And so those those um, curriculum areas will be looking at this model eventually. Um, and so so it's not universal across the department, but I agree that it's been a good uh, framework from which that we can work. So we expect to see it more in use as we move through the process. Thank you for that. And um, I also just wanted to, you know, acknowledge that when you started Dr. Cuppet, you also just mentioned how um, the, the depth and breadth of what needs to happen within FCPS, that it's not just, you know, our social studies and history um, departments that need to be doing this equity audit, but looking across the board. And then it's also not just curriculum, it's also instruction, um, it's content, it's hiring and retention, it's sort of the, the systemic lens that we need to, to be taking. And, you know, I appreciate that. And thank you, Eric, for that description of um, the process that uh, social studies was using. I think that um, is really uh, the the lens that we need to be taking because as um, as you were talking, I was also just jotting that down, you know, in terms of the instructional resources, how are we truly ensuring that we're not just selecting the, the Eurocentric, um, you know, dominant narrative that uh, has typically been used and how are we making sure that we're really expanding beyond those, those single narratives um, when selecting the, the resources. Um, or you know the the foundations that um, our educators are really building off of within the classroom. So I appreciate that. Um, and in terms of the culturally responsive teaching um, opportunities for PD, is that available to all teachers at all levels, or is that more focused on the the social studies um, department that um, Colleen mentioned? As far as uh, is culturally responsive teaching available to all teachers? Is that what I'm hearing the, versus the, in social studies? Right. So is it are those professional development opportunities available yeah. across the system? So Dr. Lewis Phillips, you want to address a little bit about how we approach that as a district? Yes, I can answer part of that. Um, 
The, the work of cultural competency and culturally proficient pedagogy and teaching has actually been taking place in Frederick County for well over a decade, even before I assumed this role. Um, my predecessor, Marie Whittemore, did a lot of that work. And there are some required PD, PL professional learning sessions um, that school sa staff have to engage in at least once a year. Um, but for the past five or six years, um, as we began with the cultural proficiency initiative, this moved into looking at equity, and it's always been about equity, uh, more of that PL has been done. Uh, we have equity representatives in each of our schools. And I think your question is an important one. And what I will say is, while there's work that we've done and teachers have been exposed to that, when, when you go back to looking at inequitable structures that are so ingrained in our society and in our institutions, part of the elimination of those types of structures is by continuing to examine and talk about and look at the policies, the practices, the structures, the attitudes that are in place to begin dismantling them. So while there is work that has been done, there is work that needs to continue to happen because oftentimes one, one thinks that by um, making sure that the totality of our history is taught and that students see themselves in our curricula and in our resources, more than that's needed. And when we think about practices, one of the practices is pedagogy, that art and science of teaching. How do we instruct students? And, and some of the research that we use there comes from Lansing Billings in regard to, it's not just making sure that those, those faces and those moments in history are there and interwoven throughout what we do, but it's, do our teachers know how to teach the learner? So it's, it's looking at, do our teachers know how to teach the learner? Do they know how to connect that content to um, things of interest to students locally, nationally, globally, to be able to make those intersections for students so that they see themselves in what they're, what they're teaching? And, and are the teachers passionate about that? And so that doesn't just, you know, I went to an HBCU, elementary education major. We didn't have that type of conversation when I was going through and matriculating through my education program. So to assume that teachers know how to do that, I did methods of math, ELA, reading, science, phys ed, and art. We were taught those methods. And again, we were taught from a very Eurocentric, white dominant perspective, because that's how our, that's our, our educational system is, is arranged. Um, so to expect our teachers to be able to do that entering our schools, our teacher prep programs need to do more, we need to do more to, to, to make sure that, they, that that multicultural pedagogy is something that they understand. And again, they're looking at each individual in their classroom and not making broad assumptions about a child once they enter that room. So again, there's a lot more I can say about that, but th those are, there, there are many considerations that we have to make. So the short answer to your question is, yes, that work has been done, but it needs to continue and more needs to be done to make sure that our teachers feel confident and are ready to do that. And they're not confident already because they don't want to be. We just have to continue to prepare them because they were students once that received education and then received training the way that their teachers received it. So again, it's breaking down those structures and those embedded practices that have been part of our educational institution for generations. Thank you. If I can add where we are with the secondary social studies program with that, um, that's that transformational piece that we want to get to. And um, MSDE, because of the framework that they've chosen through inquiry, that's really the power of inquiry. Because when we frame instruction around an inquiry question, such as who really built America? Um, does racial equality depend on government action? Was the American Revolution a civil war? that allows our students to really explore those topics instead of being funneled into a single narrative that is usually a Eurocentric narrative. Um, when it comes to culturally responsive teaching in social studies, we don't just deploy it as part of our professional learning, we deploy it as uh, integral to our entire program. So right now we have teachers working in curriculum workshops, building out digital resources. Um, their task for the first week of those digital resources was to embed opportunities for teachers to get to know their kids and kids to get to know their teachers because we need to bring the cultural capital of our students into the classroom. And also, it also integrates quite nicely with our SEL um, you know, and what we want to do with social emotional learning. Um, it, it 
also integrates well with our framework for teaching and the necessity to build relationships with students. And that's really um, that important foundational piece because if we don't have those relationships, um, it makes learning uh, that much more difficult. Thank you for that. Great stuff. Um, Dr. Cuppet, did we have somebody that wanted to comment? <clears throat> yeah, I believe uh, it's um, Anna Loam. Uh, if Anna, if you can hear us and you're still connected, if you'd like to provide public comment, you can unmute and do that. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I'm not, I've never done this before, um, so thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak. I'm just going to pull up the email that I sent, so that way I can read through as briefly as I can. Um, what I noticed in regard to the uh, curriculum outlines as a middle school teacher was that African history was addressed in the sixth grade, but not necessarily African American history. Um, the elementary school curriculum provided that tier one um, overview that you were speaking about related to important figures of American history, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King. Um, there were certain figures focused on, um, but it seemed to stop once they reach elementary school or middle school. So I just wanted to bring that particularly uh, to the forefront because I will be transitioning from teaching English and math next year to um, teaching history. And so as I've been prepping, I've noticed that particular um, spot that might need just a little bit more attention. Um, I don't know if there's a way to create a supplemental unit um, related to black history um, or women's history, because I noticed on the outline that women's history wasn't addressed for seventh grade. Um, and it could be related to the, the a certain month, um, if it wanted to be that direct, or if it wanted to be a unit, a supplemental unit created that brings in something every single month. I'm not sure. I've never done anything like that. But I just wanted to make it noted that that information seemed to be missing from sixth and seventh grade. The eighth grade curriculum, since it addresses American history, has, you know, an abundance of standards that seem to be related to those two, at least when you look at the chart. But um, those two particularly seem sparse for sixth and seventh grade. And um, I also wanted to just bring up the point that as a special education teacher, um, you know, those with disabilities are also considered to be a marginalized group. And um, if there's any work that could be done to bring that into um, into focus, that would be, um, you know, another area that research could be done. Um, additionally, with that in mind, the curriculum might need to be reviewed through that type of lens because I noticed that they're just in my teaching, history is very difficult to teach um, to those students with special needs because of how intensive it is. And I'm not sure that um, the way that it's presented is always ad adapted in the best way that it could be. And so um, I just wanted to bring that idea forward as the year comes up, we um, might have to rely on digital learning. And that is going to change a little bit. Well, it's going to change a lot of how well our students do in history. Um, I noticed that the last three months, um, I could say across the board, my eighth graders struggled greatly with understanding American history concepts, the eighth grade curriculum, because of how intensive it is. Um, additionally, um, the last thing I wanted to say, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I closed it. Um, in regard to the uh, resources that are used, I taught briefly in a Catholic school 
and um, was made aware at that time that there are certain publishers that have textbooks that are written through a specific lens. And there are, are black history textbooks. Um, I worked at a Catholic school and there were Catholic history textbooks. Um, not that you have to purchase for the entire county, but um, if it's something to use as research to see what could be used to expand teachers' knowledge and expand the uh, opportunities that we have for professional development, um, those types of uh, resources could be looked at as well. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. We appreciate hearing from the teachers in the classroom. I do, and uh, I love the work that all you people are doing. It's, it's great work, but it always is good to hear from teachers in the classroom. Um, I wanted to also refer back before we leave this, and I'll open it back up, but I wanted to say thank you. Um, when we were receiving a lot of emails on anti-racist uh, education um, and the, the uh, petition that was sent from the, the, the students, um, they had included a reading list, and I had asked if we could look at that, and you did, to see uh, what was already potentially on the approved list. What I didn't realize is how many of those were adult literature, and that, of course, presents a, an issue. Um, but, you know, it is good to know that some of them are, and they at least one was being used in the classroom, I believe it was James Baldwin's book. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you for doing that. And, and I know you all continue to look at resources and ones that are age appropriate, um, and a, that is so crucial to getting those into the hands of the teachers who will then be able to use them. Um, my last year teaching the, our fourth grade um, team did a unit from MSDE that I talk about a lot because it was such a good unit and I only found it my last year teaching it was um, actions speak louder than words. And in language arts, we focused on Langston Hughes and Frederick Douglass and um, oh my gosh, Marian Anderson. And we had literature that went with that. So they, the students saw their lives from when they were children and, and up. And then the, the um, hardships they encountered in their lives and overcame. So it was very hopeful and positive. And aside from that, we pulled in Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Ed. Now, will those fourth graders who are now in middle school tell you about Supreme Court cases? No, but what they got was wow, separate really was not equal and that was not fair. And so that's a place we hope to start. You know, I hope we started sowing those seeds in fourth grade. So thank you for um, cross-referencing that list and, and taking action on that. Anybody else have anything else? Eric? Yes, yeah, yeah, so if I could just add, um, I know that I mentioned the four levels of banks model. Now I wanna make sure I make clear that we're not saying that you don't do levels one and two. Um, it is important to celebrate individuals in those moments in history, but it needs to be, it could be an integration of all those four levels. Uh, again, primarily where we see ourselves is in level one, sometimes in two, and we want to be at level four as well, level three. And by getting to those levels, we also are helping students to be able to understand those structural inequities and why they exist and why people perceive and feel and have the attitudes they do related to certain things that are happening in our society today and how they can take action against those things. So it really needs to be a combination or how they can inform those things. So it really needs to be a combination of those four levels. I just had one other question in terms of um, what are the next steps now that the equity audit um, has been completed? It has been completed, right? I think that's what um, you shared. What's the next steps of um, sort of moving through the process now that, that the audit itself is completed? What, what happens next for social studies at least? Well, I kind of consider that like our formative assessment. It gives us data for us to take actionable steps moving for moving forward. So as we build out the instructional materials for our course and as we develop our professional learning plan for our teachers moving forward, we will use that information to inform our practice. When we look at um, and each each level, we had a, a middle school group and a high school group and you can imagine this was a huge task um, and they had very limited time. Um, so this was our first go. Um, we certainly need to do a much deeper dive 
um, into this, but at least for, for this summer, it's about bringing um, more instructional resources to bear to teach the standards. Um, and, you know, I'll address the power of open educational resources versus a textbook. Um, you know, we did a, a quick audit. Um, Dr. Coppett doesn't even have this because it got, you know, I, I wanted to pull together, you know, how much are we really leveraging technology and more than 150 um, different sites of resources, everything from the Reginald F. Lewis Museum to um, American Archives, Asia Society, those are those are the types of resources we can bring into the narrative and make it a more 360 degree narrative. So how we will use the equity audit, we'll use it to, if we need to, um, to revise standards where, where the group determined, you know, we have some issues with standards here. Um, Ms. Loam pointed out the, the issue of, and, and we can see it on the, the standards document, where are the women um, in, in our history? They, they're absent. Um, the other thing I, I do want to say too is you can really notice, I think, um, the difference between the new state standards and um, the old state standards because our sixth and seventh grade curriculum are still old standards. Uh, the state has not done anything with them yet. That doesn't mean that we're not enriching and making them more robust um, in the in our instructional practice. But the state, that's the next thing that they're going to chip at. So. I hope that answered your question of how we're going to move forward. It does. Thank you. Um, and also just to reiterate Karen's um, gratitude and thanks for, for everything that, that you all have been pull, pulling together um, very quickly and in the midst of everything else going on. So thank you. I just want to say thanks to Ms. Bernard for inviting me out to the American Studies One uh, workshop last year and being able to share my story a little bit with some of our teachers and you know, I hope it had some kind of impact that we do need to change the narrative a little bit. Um, and I know that from what I'm hearing today, there are changes being made. Um, there have been some changes, but you know, we're gonna we're gonna work hard to make sure that our our curriculum, our teaching, our, our teachers are teaching from an equity lens. And I appreciate the efforts. And I know we're not done. And we, we're going to keep working hard to get that done. And Anna, I know they're going to listen to your suggestions as well. And appreciate you sharing um, and looking into what your changes are about to become. So thank you for, for changing and teaching a different subject and probably getting out of your, your wheelhouse and your, your box. And, you know, that's what that's what a lot of our teachers need to do sometimes. And, and so, you know, as Ms. Yoho mentioned earlier, sometimes we get in a rut and, you know, we, we teach what we know. And, you know, when we're faced with, with some kind of some, some challenges, adversity, that we're willing to look at it from a different lens and um, learn ourselves, as Mr. Beninsky said earlier, you know, he's still learning and he's, he's young. Um, so, you know, we're all learning this process as we're going forward. And, you know, I hope the public knows that we're here to work with you, not against you. Um, we do take suggestions and try to implement them. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's moves like the Titanic for, for some people. We're trying to move it like a speedboat and, you know, it, it, we're going to, we're going to keep working hard and appreciate everything that you all have done that I've seen over the last year and a half on the board. Um, Gosh, it's going quick. Um, so, you know, just <laughs> just uh, thank you for everything and we're gonna keep, keep working hard. Thank you. And I'll uh, once again chime in, but Jay, I'm sure they did learn something from you because that firsthand experience of what you went through, I think that's what we need to do is just, uh, I've learned so much in the last 10 years, just I didn't know about redlining. I didn't know about sundown towns. Um, but there's a novel that I read with fifth graders, Bud Not Buddy, small groups, you know, in literature circles, but it talks about sundown towns if it doesn't use the exact word. Um, and, and so these are all things I've learned about. I just watched a, an eight and a half minute video of Richard Rothstein, who I really like because he talks about the effects of poverty on education, but he talked about the history of 
I was just fascinating in eight and a half minutes what I learned about how we got the projects in cities which were originally meant for white people and black people, but then it changed. And Levittown, even in their uh, this planned community, in their um, mortgage deed, they were not allowed to sell to black people. And he talks about the effects that had on wealth over the generations. In eight and a half minutes, I just learned even more. So we have to keep going and, and making people aware of these things that we've just lived with and didn't know existed and and that with all the work you all are doing and with first-hand accounts i think it's so crucial so again thank you very much um i'll get off my soapbox now but anything else i think we could all get on a soapbox if we <laughs> had all day i know and these are the people to be on the soapbox with so they they we probably never get off of it but, <laughs> anyway but we're gonna let you all go get back to work and move on to our next topic so thank you thank you appreciate thank you team appreciate it fantastic job okay and thank I, you you mr C dr cuppet uh for yeah. pre-k expansion so we have some uh, fantastic news. If you've already looked through the document, um, we were a little late finding out about this grant. Um, what we were hearing from MSDE is that there was a lot of uncertainty around the budget, the state level budget. And so we actually got approval for this grant last Friday. And so um, this is the continuing march towards moving our pre-Ks from half day to full day programs, which we have a lot of data talking about the efficacy of that and how great it is. And so we were approved for a $900,000 expansion grant that we're seeking um, approval for. And this will go on to the consent agenda this evening. As you can see, this is uh, anytime you expand from a half to a full day, we have to hire teacher um, support for that. Um, so this, this grant not only hires teachers, but also EL instructional assistants. Um, you can see the four schools, Monocacy, Hillcrest, Waverly, and Lincoln will be the benefactors of this. Um, and uh, there's some additional cost in here for things like family events and field trips, some of those value added opportunities. Um, we are getting to the place in Frederick County Public Schools where uh, we need to begin outfitting classrooms. So whether it's through this funds or whether there are or are not future blueprint funds, as we expand, um, we may actually have to um, buy those classroom uh, sets of furnitures because four-year-olds use some pretty tiny stuff, right? So um, the, there are some family involvement funds in here at all, and it's all outlined in the budget sheets there, but we're very excited about this. And uh, if, the, if this is passed on to consent and approved tonight, we can get those uh, principles in the, the mode of ordering materials and hiring staff and so on. So we're seeking your approval and request this move to, be, to consent agenda this evening. So moved. I'll second, um, but I did, is this posted to, to board docs? It I, is now, I had to refresh. <laughs> so yes, it came as a later edition and I was like, oh my gosh, it's not on the one I had pulled up. So if you pull it up now in board docs, it is there, I'm looking at it. Ah, I see it now, thank you. Any questions on that? Concerns? Nope. <laughs> well. I guess my only thought, and I was pulling up the document while you were talking, so I apologize um, if I missed this. Um, you know, the whole thing with pre-K and space, and especially at this time where we're looking at keeping kids up, you know, limiting the number of students. So uh, what is the feeling about space um, allowances, accommodations in the schools? And Ms. Yoha, are you referring to with a possible atypical opening to the school versus long-term space plans? Yes. Space plans. <laughs> so I'll give you both. Um, obviously we were gonna, if, if, if things move forward and we move to a model and we're in stage two in the fall and we must maintain social distancing, uh, then what we're what you'll see in tonight's materials, obviously, um, is the recovery plan. And so the same um, the same um, pre precautions would be put in place for pre-case as well. We bring in 
half of the kids on two days and half on the other two days uh, in the week. Um, principals would be responsible for ensuring that whatever half of that class is, uh, that it meets the social distancing requirements. A lot of our principals have actually been going out and into their rooms and doing the measurements and those types of things. So they've been doing a lot of preparatory work. So the same would apply to pre-K as it would to the other grade levels. As far as the long-term um, discussion, Maryland is moving towards what they call a mixed delivery model, which means that we here in the public schools will create all day pre-K sessions, uh, but that private um, institutions can as well. So for instance, right now at um, the Children's Center in Walkersville, Maryland, we have one private group that, one private um, entity that is providing state funded all day pre-kindergarten. Okay, so the goal for the state knowing that if you simply expanded this everywhere across any of our school districts, they were going to run into capital improvement issues, right? Portables or additions or those types of things. And so they opted for this mixed delivery model. Um, now, all that is predicated on additional blueprint um, funding. And we know what happened with that legislation. So a lot remains to be seen. Uh, the, the funds that we were getting this year for expansion will go forward because they were under that previous two-year legislation that allowed for some funding. So um, depending on what happens with the funds, we will either be working in collaboration with these private entities to see if they can spin up locations. Uh, but we do have a multi-year timeline for here in Frederick County. Uh, we're just now getting into the situation where... Um, you know, it's going to be a little more challenging because we do get into either space and or furniture related issues. But I, I will tell you that our principals in our schools are prioritizing this because they know the value of early intervention. So when it comes to juggling teachers around, um, they're getting pretty creative with their um, their use of space. So um, depending on what happens with funding from the state, we'll obviously keep the board um, updated on where we're headed. So next year, or this next legislative session will be interesting. That it will. I have two, two questions. Uh -huh. um, do we know how many students in each school? And also um, for pre-K, we currently, um, I think, go off based off the parents' income. And Correct. is this that type of, we're going to, it's not just open to everybody. We Correct. do have our, Now, uh, Mr. Mason, I think it's a great question. We, we, um, we go off income guidelines, but the, the thing that's happening with this expansion is that they're actually raising those income levels. Um, and so um, I don't know the exact, I think we were at 180 of the poverty level initially, and now it's to 300%. But beyond 300%, the state's intention is that those families, I think it's 300 to 600% of the poverty would, would pay on a sliding scale a tuition. So the state would fund part and, and uh, individuals, families could fund, fund part. We're still in the, the, we still have enough students who are eligible uh, under that 300 that we're filling our, our locations. As to the exact number of full day slots at each school, um, I don't have that right in front of me, but I'd be happy to email that to the committee. Okay, thank you. Yep, it's grown considerably over the years. We're very excited about it. Great. Any other questions on that? Yeah, I won't even get into the concerns until <laughs> that have come up at um, uh, the May meetings, Maryland Association of Boards of Ed, um, with the uh, private providers that aren't jumping on board. So, because uh, <laughs> the bar is very high, so and charging people to send their kids to public school. Anyway, it gets to be a whole philosophical thing, and we'll go there when when we get to that point. But thank you for this for now. Okay. Anything else for the good of the group? Was there anything else on the agenda that I missed, Dr. Cuppet? Oh, he left. Yep. <laughs> we just, okay. just there he is. There you are. <laughs> if I don't, if there's a question, I don't feel like answering. I'm just going to run now. I, wow. I do believe the only thing would be looking ahead to the agenda we usually do at the end of each meeting. Um, is Linda still on here? Yeah, there she is. So I, I believe that the um, uh, the next meeting, I can't remember off the top of my head. Linda, do you have that handy by chance? Let me just double check. 
Um, I don't, I don't have the document up, but I know we're bringing. I have it. Assessments for learning in 2020. 20 yes. Yes. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate Sorry that. That's going to be the board had significant questions as we did around assessing students post uh, continuity of learning and, and into the fall. What do we do for that? So you'll see that narrative has given that into the plan that you're um, uh, that you're going to review this evening, but the details are not all there. We, we're almost done um, working those out. And so our goal was to bring that assessment plan back to CNI, which we, we've had in the past, but you, we've usually done it much sooner. Mm -hmm. um, but with the disruption of COVID and trying to make some more timely decisions around assessment, we just decided that the best time to bring it would be in August. And then um, the proposed calendar is laid out there. We know you, you know that we can always adjust those reports back from content areas or from EL or some of those standing reports. Ms. Yoho always come back, but if timely topics come up, given adequate notice, we can bring those presentations to the CNI committee. So I think August is set up and that'll be a lengthy conversation, I would imagine. So you had also mentioned Dr. Cuppet at the beginning of the meeting that, you know, outside of the, the social studies department, all of the yeah. um, departments were completing this, you know, equity audit and assessment and developing their equity plans um, for moving forward. And I, I, I personally would love to hear from other content areas as well moving forward. So I don't know if, you know, we can space them out through out our meeting dates, but I would love to hear, you know, what um, the, the English department is thinking about in terms of their equity plans and math and science and, and moving forward. So I don't know if there are other board members who would be interested in hearing that as well, but I think that that would be important information for this group to consider or to yeah. hearing. So um, Ms. Gallagher, I think that would be fantastic. I think as they bring their reviews to you, um, highlighting their equity plans as part of their presentation would be the most logical choice. And what we can do is Dr. Seaton and Linda and I can look at the agenda. If there's somebody who's not getting to you anytime soon, so to speak, we may have them come up and share maybe their equity component only. Um, a lot of times we place them on the schedule based on when things are coming from MSDE and when there are going to be updates. Uh, but Dr. Seaton and I and Linda will sit down and we'll look at how to get the equity plans to you through the course of this calendar year. Does that sound like an appropriate plan? Very good. Okay. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Ray. That's a great suggestion. And if I might say, uh, English language arts is on the schedule for October 7th. So that's not too far away, really. So. Yeah. And uh, I think they'll have um, clear information for you around their equity plans. Um, I will tell you that Jen Ralston, who's our new curriculum specialist for elementary and English language arts from day one, set up the right to read as an equity based issue. It was out in front in her very first presentation to her literacy specialist. And so it's a topic that she's very passionate about. Um, all of our specialists have had a lot of anxiety around student learning because of the COVID closure. Um, but in almost every conversation I've had with her, she's about, let's find out where kids are when they get back. We need to get them the appropriate support. We need to equip teachers with the tools that they need. Um, they're creating digital resources to support the continuation of our phonics program. So she's very passionate about it and we'll be excited to share that, I'm sure as will Sue Ann. She's, she's been really looking at um, one of their big areas, of course, are what are the books that we put in front of kids? What are the texts that represent all of our students, not, as we said, European, Eurocentric kind of um, literature? So um, they're looking at that as part of their middle and high school um, approach to, to the equity-based things. All right. So we good? I think we're good. Thank you Thanks, so much. Kevin. Appreciate Thank you all. You guys have a great day. I'll see you this afternoon. <laughs> see ya. All right. Well.